Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well. And yourself? I'm living the dream. So, Phil, I I read on uh, the CNBC.com financial website, this ticker came across, the EU cracking down on some new law they passed. I don't know what it is. I didn't get a chance to read the story. They start looking into uh, Meta, Facebook, that is the same, Apple, Google. Uh, apparently, it's some. I think it has to do with big tech companies, Phil. And, uh, I look at tech stocks are down about a half percent this morning in futures trading. Is this a problem? Uh, in the near term, no, it's not a problem. Regulation takes a really long time, and there's kind of a, a, a double whammy as to why this isn't an immediate issue. The first one is because it's international news, and that's kind of a rule of thumb, and I hate to say it like that, but it is accurate. The international news typically has a one- or two-day lifespan unless it's China, has a one- or two-day lifespan. And then on top of that, regulation takes so very long, and sometimes it just gets lost in the weeds. If, if you want to look for an example, look at TikTok in itself. And I don't know a lot about TikTok other than I know that it's kind of the, one of the preferred social media uh, uh, platforms for younger people. But I also know that no matter what they've tried to do, they can't stop TikTok. And that's not even an American company, but well, I guess it's third-party American. But the but at the end of the day, no, at, in, in the moment, it's not. And I kind of look for something other than the Federal Reserve and, and my constant uh, congratulations to Jay Powell that I'm sure everybody gets tired of and the movement of, if, of inflation and interest rates to be another headline. But in the near term, that is what we're dealing with, is inflation and what the Federal Reserve, how they how they view it and what they do in reaction to it. Now, that could be something, this could be something with all these mega, mega cap stocks that would be in the future. But it is that right now it's a short-term story. It's kind of just filling in the gap or substituting until we get to those PCE numbers. Is it possible, Phil, that... If indeed, if we look down the road, and who knows how many years this could take and speculation and whatever, but is it possible that if you broke up these megatech companies, that they would become more valuable as the sum of all their parts as opposed to one giant part? Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely it is. And, 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 and how they're broken up, and you see that oftentimes with spinoffs. And a spinoff, that you'll have a spinoff from one company, and all of a sudden you, you add those two together, and as a stockholder, you get that spinoff, and now I have another I have another stock, but the combination of those two was way more valuable than what I had in just that one. So, and again, like you had just mentioned, this could take years. And in the interim, you also have uh, 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 leaders that change hands. So you might have another party that comes in that does away with whatever the regulations were. So. You know, again, it, it is a headline, and it's something to, to maybe put in your back pocket, read it today. But in the near term, I certainly wouldn't go out changing the structure of your portfolio because of it. It's interesting because the Justice Department is the one that opened up the case against Apple, and you've got a Democrat in the White House, and it's when you look at the politics of big tech, and the narrative has been that big tech favors Democrats with their contributions – and with cooperation with helping to get uh, people elected, yet this is the Biden Justice Department that's going after Apple. Could I be mistaken in that, that this was opened up under another administration and it was just followed through under Biden? I could be wrong with that. but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I that's a good question. That, I think the whole case with Apple was opened up in the previous administration and just followed through with, with this one. And I, and I could be wrong. But, and that's just an example of how long this stuff actually uh, comes to pass, where by the, by the time we get finished with Apple, there may be another administration back in the office. So it's hard to tell. But, you know, Apple has struggled a little bit. And I was listening to, you know, Apple's garnering a lot of attention because it hasn't followed what the other mega cap stocks have done over the past you know, six months or so. And so there's a lot of discussion because it's so widely owned and whether or not people should be worried. And what I heard this morning, and, and I kind of, and I kind of understand, is now they're looking for buying opportunities because it's trading at a multiple much lower than what it was, what it had been trading for in the past. So a lot, a lot of mutual funds and a lot of portfolio managers may start to look at Apple and say, "Hey, look, based off of this intrinsic value, 
this looks really, really attractive to me now. And we know by their balance sheet that they're making money. They're in. They're kind of in a little uh, freeze with iPhone sales, but but they're still making money hand over fist. And you remember back in during, uh, just as COVID began, how much cash Apple had on hand. If we, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers. I just remember it was astonishing. But that company is still profitable, and it's trading at a multiple much lower than what it was. Uh, in the past, so it does become more attractive. There was a story on the news this morning, uh, Network News, that uh, China is going to start, uh, the way we approach TikTok, China's going to start to take the same approach with our chip manufacturers and such, and they're mentioning that this could severely affect some of the chip makers that have uh, that do a lot of business in China, Microsoft as well. Have you heard anything about this, Phil? No, but it, it, a little bit, some grumblings as we uh, as we come after their companies, their retaliation would be to come after our company. And it's kind of like the tariff war we had with them not long ago that uh, kind of set our markets back a little bit as well as China's markets. But if you remember the tariff war where we would place a tariff on China and they would retaliate with a tariff on us, we were in a much stronger position. I think we ended up kind of winning that uh, that tit for tat. But that, that would go along the same lines, like, hey, you come after our companies, we'll come after your companies. And I don't know that that's going to slow, slow us down with what we're doing with TikTok. But at the same time, you know, regulation takes forever uh, to get accomplished, and it has to go through all these, all these different phases. So I, I'm not sure that, that that may be a bigger concern, quite honestly. That may be a bigger concern than what the EU is doing right now. Billy, yeah. Good morning, Phil. Uh, you use the term a second ago forever. Uh, brings to mind a last night on sixty minutes. They were talking about the uh, precious mineral uh, minerals, trace metals on the bottom of the sea floor, and all the countries are making a play for these. And one of the largest uh, collections is between. Uh, San Diego and Hawaii. Uh, a lot of countries making the play for these, except the U.S. Uh, we're not a signature of the law of the sea. There's something like 130 countries uh, signature of the law of the sea. We're not. Therefore, we're going to kind of be pushed out to the side. How does the market address something? This is long term, a middle and not short term. How does the market address something like this? Uh, our markets really doesn't address it at all. But if you wanted exposure to it, it would you would address it by how you purchase uh, exposure to those precious metals. So whether I'm doing it on an international basis or here at home. So if you wanted, hey, whatever it is at the bottom, I know very little about that bill, so I can't speak uh, in depth. Uh, I was driving when 60 Minutes was on, but the if, if you wanted exposure to it as an investor, then that's how you would obtain it. But our overall markets, it would just be something that we're not participating in by and large. Now, if it came to the point where we needed these metals and now we have to pay more for them because we're not the ones obtaining them and we have to pay additional taxes or tariffs on them, uh, God forbid, if we need those metals, then that, that would have a play on inflation. But, again, way down the road, but that, that would hurt us in terms of inflation. But overall market in the immediate future uh, not much, just other than how would you invest in it? Yeah, I think that was called the Treaty of the Sea, uh, if I remember that a feature last night. L- law, law of the Sea. You sure it was Law? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm, I've been work, been familiar with this for the you, last 25, 30 years. They had it nearly passed, but then the Heritage Foundation came out against it, and yeah. that changed the votes of 30, 35 uh, senators. It, started, it came close to being passed under the Reagan years, in the uh, early part of the Reagan years, and uh, the... Uh, mining industry, and at that time, the military was against the military. Subsequently, come around thinking that they supported the law of the sea, but it's come uh, come close two or three times. Once under George W. Bush, and now they're making another push. Not only, and I'm getting off the subject a little uh-huh. bit, but uh, not only we're we talking about the the minerals in the uh, uh, the Clipperton zone between Hawaii and, and San Diego and, and Mexico, but it's also impacting the Arctic. Now the ice is melting off the Arctic. This is a uh, great opportunity for both fishery and mineral mining. And there's a large section of the Arctic that is unclaimed. The other countries are going out to this full with robust energy. U.S. has been pushed outside. Have no say so. 
Bill, I have a question for you because yeah. I, I know very little about this, but it's interesting. Why wouldn't the U.S. be interested in that? Because the uh, Heritage Foundation and some of the others, uh, and they've gotten the ear of the Republicans, saying, why should we play with everybody else? Why don't we go ahead and use our resources and to go ahead and take what we want to heck with it, to any sorts of tre- any sort any treaties, and they the problem comes up where there's a lot of money invested, and people are not going to invest the money to only to lose in a subsequent court case. If you have a treaty, and if the U.S. is working independent of the treaty, if it goes to the world court, which it probably will, then the U.S. will lose, or the investors the investors will lose. Yeah, I yeah, they didn't want the United States to be subject to a yeah, world court. That's right. They wanted the United States to have their own sovereign interest on it. Uh, Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning, Phil. <clears throat> Let's catastrophize a little bit. Just, you know, turn go really negative here for, 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 for grins. Are you going to bring up Jerome Powell? No. <laughs> uh, you let Jerome Powell over, Ross. We, we had a deep discussion about Jake Powell. I said eventually he's going to have to give Jerome Powell some credit, eventually. No, I want to talk about the, the budget deal. We just had another a $1.2 trillion budget deal sneak through Congress, and I believe the president just signed it. Um, at the end of 2023, we, the, the U.S. debt was $33.17 trillion, giving us, according to Axios, the debt-to-GDP ratio is 123%. So how long, uh, put on your economist hat now, is there any way in the world that we can possibly sustain this indefinitely without a correction? And the question actually is, now in your investor investment portfolio thing, if it does crash, and if it does, you know, if, if things just, if, if it settles out, how do, do you see that manifesting itself in terms of portfolios? How does, and how do we protect, it, protect ourselves? What is, how does that, how does that reckoning manifest itself in your worst nightmares? If you would define crash for me, you mean does the economy crash or does portfolio well, I, the, the, the result, the, the result of, of outspending our our ability to pay it, I mean, we, the debt the 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 debt to GDP ratio being one hundred and twenty three percent, there comes a point that our debt service out outstrips our ability to pay it. And that would come with the uh, the same thing that the the kind of the same thing that we're doing right now, where we're slowing down the economy that Jay Powell's done a really good job with, but the <laughs> but slowing down the economy by Number one, the bond issue went slowing down, though, so they have continued that. The second part, though, of it is, and this is why we're all confident in this. And look, I know I take everything back to current interest rates and, and what the Federal Reserve may do, but we have to remember that we're paying interest as well. So when the Federal Reserve begins to cut interest rates, that helps us to pay off some of this debt in in, in a way. And you also have something else that could come into play, and, and that's a, this something we'll certainly be talking about in the near future, is do these Trump tax cuts reset in the following years? Do we start to tax people more in order to pay off our debt? Now, what would happen if they increase tax rates? Ultimately, what that does is give us Americans less money to spend, thus slowing the economy down, and if it slows the economy down, uh, sure, surely to follow, follow is the stock market. But we have to define what we mean by crash and correction. When you say correction, the first thing that pops in my head is 10%. And that is a 10% fall from previous highs. I don't fear corrections. I don't like them when they're happening. I don't necessarily fear corrections because they are a healthy part of a bull market. I fear a bear market, which is a 20% drop, which we experienced in 2022, a 20% drop from previous highs but this is the our national debt has always been on the forefront and our fear on the street is always be how are we going to pay for this ultimately it has to come from tax revenue so you have some people that say hey we need to stop spending so much which i wouldn't disagree and then you have others say no keep spending we just need to increase taxes whether it's on corporations or on the rich the problem though is and i'm probably putting a foot in, into the political world i'd rather not but as you tax corporations who pays our citizens but corporations and if you're taxing corporations to a level where they can't pay their workers what they used to pay our workers then we don't have the money to spend so to me it's an indirect tax on everyone that they're paying but ultimately those are the debates that we'll hear 
leading up to November, and we'll probably be hearing this for years to come, is what we do about our national debt because it is out of control, and it has been out of control. But to this point, our economy has been able to withstand it. Financial Phil McCoy, our guest here on the program. CNBC.com website has an article on uh, hiring a financial advisor. Phil, and I'm sure you get this question all the time, but if you are looking for a financial advisor, what are some questions you should ask and what are some things you should be looking for? Well, depending on what your exact needs are, and I'll give you two different examples. If you're a 20-year-old that said, hey, I got ten grand for my grandparents as a gift for Christmas, and I just kind of want to put that away and let it grow as much as possible and revisit it when I'm nearing retirement, you can look for Uh, just a run-of-the-mill financial advisor without much credentials. They can plot that into an exchange trade of fund for you, and you can lock it in there and forget it. Hopefully, they've got the forethought to say, hey, let's look at Roth contributions and the likes and and make some moves uh, along those lines, make sure you have proper liquidity. But on the other hand, in how most people come to us, is they're in or nearing retirement, and they realize that, boy, I've really got some work to do, I've done a good job saving money uh, over the years, but now that I head into retirement, it's the biggest change of your life. Everything changes, not just your income, but your expenses are changed. Sometimes, you know, we see a lot that people's expenses are about the same. They just spend it on different things. And your health care and all these different things that come into play in retirement and what, how much can I spend or how much am I, as they say, it's that we don't allow people to spend money or disallow them, but how much am I allowed to spend that's where you really should look for a financial planner, and they have those CFP designations. And, and what that basically does is it's covering all financial aspects of your life, just not the investment part. You know, we say this in, in closed doors, and we come on the radio, and we talk about uh, intraday market movements and what's happened the last month or the last week. In reality, our day is focused on long-term goals and long-term results, and I don't mean long-term by like six months or a year. We're talking decades in some cases or 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 20 30 40 years for the span of someone's life but along that time frame we know that there's going to be things that come up there's going to be wants wishes and needs we, we place them all in these boxes what's what are your needs and then after your needs are met what are your wants and can we meet those wants and then finally what are your wishes would you do you wish to leave money to a child or a grandchild or to a charity uh, do you wish to go to Hawaii every 10th year, maybe when you're 70 and 80, whatever it may be, do I have enough money to accomplish those goals? And along the way, run into tragedies. Along the way, I'm going to have some illnesses. Along the way, I'm going to have a family member that passes away that I could receive a financial windfall from. What do I do with that? And that is where a financial planner comes into place. We're looking at not just investments. That's kind of the easy part quite honestly the investment part is fairly easy in the long run because we know what happens in the long term that's why i always see you know one of my clients that listens to us they said you always seem like you think the markets are going to go up and i was like i do i think the markets are going to go up in the long term and that's how we think in the long term so i seem overly optimistic but i'm overly optimistic because i know what happens over the long term in the short term though is what gathers our attention what everybody's interested in But a a certified financial planner, which all of us here at the Marius Group are, um, John has been for decades, and not to date him, but he has been forever. Tyler is almost finished with his. It takes a little bit of apprenticeship before he can take and and actually use those letters. So Tyler's almost finished, and I am a CFP as well. But you should look for a CFP because they can cover all of those uh, desires that you could have in retirement and what you need to do with your money or what you want to do with your money you've worked hard for it now let's tax plan let's uh, let's get your state uh, uh, state planning in order let's look at your health care and some in some cases while we have surface level knowledge just use the state planning for an example we have surface level knowledge and john is really good with the state planning but it gets into the nitty-gritty and the legalities of it needs to be put in writing we send you somewhere and a lot of times we'll sit there with you and explain to the estate attorney exactly what we're trying to accomplish um, um, for you. So we've talked to them for years, and this is what we want to accomplish just to make sure that it's not lost in translation. So we, a financial planner who picks up a fiduciary responsibility for all of your financial needs, 
not just for this investment going up in value and be damned with the taxes and and if I have liquidity, that would be just a financial advisor. Let's place it in something to make as much as we can. We don't care about the taxes. I don't really care about your liquidity. You told me you want to make a bunch of money. I'm going to try to make you a bunch of money and then not worry about everything else. But as you have more needs, financial needs, that's where you'd want to look for the CFP. You look for a fee-based one or a commission-based one? We're uh, extremely partial to fee-based ones. Uh, Commission-based, you do have to consider if there's trades to be made or if we're replacing funds uh, inside of your portfolio. Are they doing that because Aiden needs new volleyball shoes, or are they doing that because it's in my best interest? And uh, on a fee-based account, you don't have to be concerned with uh, how many times they trade or don't trade or the flip side to it. You know, if we have someone in a investment and we think that this looked really good and we thought it was it was going to be good for the long haul, but then a portfolio manager leaves and we want to change that. But you've only been in this fund for six months and you've paid a bunch of money on top of the commission. You've paid mutual fund fees or whatever it may be that you've paid to be inside of that investment. We may be reluctant to move you out of that simply because you've already paid – the emission charges to get into the game and that we don't want to leave at halftime. But under a fee-based arrangement, it simply doesn't matter how much it's, it's traded, how much it's turned over. Uh, it, it allows us to do more for tax planning in a non-qualified account, uh, basically because we can uh, recognize gains and offset it with losses without the fear of commission. Any final questions for Financial Phil, Bill, or John? If not, Phil, take it away. You had nothing, Bill? You kept looking no, at me no, like you might, but then no, you didn't. No, we're, we're close to being out of time. One of the times uh, uh, Phil would like to discuss the uh, the third world of politics, and that's going to be the uh, uh, Medicare and Social Security, how that comes into play as you assist someone with financial management. Absolutely. I could talk about that all day long. Let's do it next week. Okay. Next Monday it is, Philip. Bill, how do people get in touch with go. you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. You can catch Financial Phil each weekday morning at 638, replayed at 738 for two minutes setting up the market day, recapping the previous one.